Hey there, friends. Welcome to our online Pentecost mission. Here is the talk I gave in front of a live studio audience here in Ottawa at a local coffee shop entitled Pentecost Unlock the Door. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Happy Goat Cafe, one of my regular hangouts in the neighborhood here. The neighborhood here, <laughs> this is the part of town, but it is a great part of town. St. Mary's is just, as you know, just on the side of the highway there, so uh, praise God for all that. Uh, certainly very thankful for your ongoing friendship and your support and your encouragement. There are some of you here who have known me for, well, quite a few, 24 hours, 24 years, you know, and others of you have just met uh, more recently all as a result of the, the online ministry that I felt the Lord inspiring me to start. Uh, it would be a couple of years ago now, during, I guess during COVID. And to paraphrase the words of Jesus in the Gospel of Luke, I have longed to share this coffee with you here this evening, right? And we are still in the season of Easter, this great octave day of Easter, so there's plenty of time and opportunity for us to just to continue to rejoice and to enjoy each other's company, uh, meet some new people, and to remember that there are many of us who are just striving one day at a time just to want to do uh, the Lord's will in our life. And that's really what inspired me to have uh, this event. I was talking to uh, James about a month or two ago and talking about how I had this desire in my heart not simply to come to a coffee shop you know, and have a coffee, but come to a coffee shop and host an event similar to this, and we, we have come together, and thanks be to God uh, for that. So I want to talk uh, this evening about Pentecost, and the, the topic is Pentecost, unlock the door. Pentecost, unlock the door. The book of Acts tells us that when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And, of course, we here, right? We're all together in this one place, uh, albeit a much more conducive place to conviviality than perhaps the, the upper room, you know, where the disciples were gathered behind the, the locked doors. Uh, you can imagine that the aroma of that place was not as uh, pleasant as perhaps a coffee shop aroma after they were the, together there locked away for a few days there, all in anticipation, ultimately, of the arrival of the Holy Spirit, but initially locked away in fear. And there's a lot of fear in our culture today. I don't know about you, but I can actually, I, I can actually sense it, particularly if I'm driving in town. Fear about who knows what. Maybe fear about the future, fear about finances, fear about health, fear about the family, fear about the career, whatever it is, right? And if we can identify with that in any way, then the fact that we're here together as uh, brothers and sisters in the Lord is an encouraging thing. So don't be hesitant about sharing with other people kind of where we're at in our life, what's going on, how the Lord's moving, how the Lord is acting. But initially, it's important for us to remember that we're not alone. I'll talk more about that uh, in a minute. But Jesus, Jesus comes to where the disciples were, which was a place where the doors of the house were locked. So it was a place of fear, a place of discouragement, a place of, a place of questioning and wondering. And the truth is that the online ministry of Sipping on the Sabbath, that uh, many of you are loyal followers of, right? And I did give you each uh, one of these cards. If you've not seen this before, uh, you could also take it home if you already have one and pass it on to somebody else. Pass it on to somebody else who you think might need an encouraging uh, word or some inspiration in their life because uh, the Lord wants as many people as possible to come to that place of encounter with him, a place of freedom, right? So, but the, the online ministry of Sipping on the Sabbath started as a result of the doors being locked. So three years ago, the churches were locked. I'm not here to debate whether that should have happened or not, but that was the fact that they were locked. And so as an itinerant preacher, 
I was just reduced to being a preacher, right? There's no itinerant ministry when things are shut down and locked up, right? So someone said to me, well, why don't you just get yourself a camera and a light and a microphone and just start talking? I'm like, well, what? I've never done that before. Like, I'm used to talking in front of people right? and engaging with people. I don't know anything about lighting or sound or videography and all that stuff. They said, just do it. So I did it. Step out in faith and just bought the stuff. And, and you, you, those of you who have been following me now for almost three years, you see kind of the gradual progression and, and change over time, you know, hairstyles and glasses <laughs> and lighting and backgrounds and the whole bit. And you know, hopefully you'll agree with me that there's been, a, there's been progress, you know, kind of <laughs> along the way, kind of slow and steady as she goes. But if I'm going to wait until I have everything figured out, if I'm going to wait until the perfect time to launch or start something, I will still be waiting. And sometimes we just got to step out in faith and respond to the inspirations and encouragements that the Holy Spirit stirs up in our hearts and take a risk. Now, I didn't know whether it was going to succeed or fail. But if it had failed, at least it would have failed and fallen flat on the floor of heaven. Do I want to live my life thinking, well, you know, I could have, should have, would have, whatever. But fear holds, holds us back, right? So the disciples themselves, nonetheless, were living in this fear. Jesus enters in, says, peace be with you. He doesn't condemn them or criticize them. But as a result of that difficult situation, Pentecost occurred. And if you and I find ourselves in a place of poverty, a place of wondering, what do I do? Where do I go? When we accept the fact that we are powerless over people, places, and things in our life, but God has all the power, and want to tap into his power, then that actually becomes an encounter with the Lord. The possibility of that, and again, the Lord, in this time of difficulty the disciples were living in, in fear, with the doors locked, he enters in, and he says to them, peace be with you. So if we ourselves, again, are experiencing any of this, the Lord has a very clear word for us. Peace be with you. He wants to enter in, and we allow him to enter in, to become a people of Pentecost. To be a Pentecost people is to do three things. And again, those of you who have been following me and listening to me, <laughs> there's always three things, right? <laughs> but tonight we've got a couple of sets of three things, right? So you, this, you, you, good thing you had some coffee here, but keep yourself awake. The three things of being a Pentecost people is that first we spirate, we aspirate, and we respirate. First thing we do is that we spirate. Spirate is the act of breathing out. John chapter 20 says, he breathed on them. The Holy Spirit spirates. Always breathes out. Holy Spirit. To aspirate is to breathe in. We define, you know, uh, desiring an achievement as an aspiration, right? But we're also called to respirate, which is what we're all doing right now. And up to five seconds ago, you were doing it with me unconsciously, but now you're very <laughs> conscious of the fact that we are respirating. We are breathing in and we're breathing out. We want to breathe in the fresh air of the Holy Spirit and to breathe out the message of the gospel. The Holy Spirit always breathes out. We breathe in order to live. We don't breathe, we don't live. And we need increased spiritual capacity, lung capacity in our life. And as evangelizers, as cooperators with the Holy Spirit in bringing the gospel to wherever it is we find ourselves, and we're here in a coffee shop. We're bringing the gospel to the marketplace. Holy Father, Pope Francis says that we have to get out of our sacristies 
get out into the marketplace, bring the gospel to the peripheries, you know, the various neighborhoods of our towns, right? And engage with people. We want to become spiritual respiratory therapists, right? Helping people right? to breathe properly as a respiration respiratory therapist would do in a hospital, so we need to do in the spiritual life. And our, and our founder, Father Bob Bedard, of the Companions of the Cross, he spoke about an explosively alive church. I don't think we clearly understand what that actually means. I have not a lot of experience in explosives. <laughs> Maybe some of you, you know, wasted your childhood in a different way, <laughs> but I have very limited experience with explosions. Okay? But I do know that they all have one thing in common. Explosions cause a mess. Explosions cause damage. Okay? Rebuilding after an explosion happens takes time. Change is difficult but necessary. I come from Glengarry County here in Ontario, and there are a few people here this evening with the Glengarry connections, right? I come from the oldest English-speaking parish in Ontario. We've had a resident priest in my parish since 1786. So I know how deep roots can go, but I also know how hard rocks can be, okay? <laughs> and some rocks can be pretty hard, right? And some roots can go really deep. But to pray for and ask the Lord to stir up the power of his Holy Spirit so that we are living in an explosively alive church means that things can't stay the same as they are. Change needs to happen. Now, those of you, again, who've been following me for the last little while have heard me say before that scripture is not simply about that which happened, past tense. It's about that which is still happening. And so how is the, the grace, the power, the blessing, the energy of Pentecost happening today? And how can I experience that? Pentecost is not something that happened 2,000 years ago to the 120 gathered in the upper room. A singular event that happened just once, and that's nice, and let's move on. We can still experience the power of the Holy Spirit. So those of us who are baptized, those of us who are confirmed, want to pray that we stir up the power of those sacraments in our life. Scripture is still happening. And this explosion... This change that occurred in the life of the disciples is meant to occur in us too. And, and change is coming. I'm not talking about theological change or scriptural change or spiritual change or sacramental change, but ecclesiastical change and parochial changes are, are coming. The question is, do I want to get on board with that, participate with that? You know, someone said earlier this evening, he said, you know what, I can see this place, this is, 20 years from now, this will be our church. I said, sign me up. Here we go. Right? <laughs> I tell people, all I need is a Vespa scooter and a portable mask kit, right? <laughs> I just go to your house. <laughs> go to your neighborhood. All this time, the energy, whatever we spend in buildings is taxing us. But that's just my opinion, right? The important thing to understand is that for Pentecost to happen now, as it happened then, there are <laughs> three, <laughs> three conditions, okay? Three requirements for us to experience Pentecost now as it, it was experienced then. Community, a difficult time, and thirdly, a personal decision. So first, there is community. And the scripture passage we have here for our consideration is Acts chapter 2, verse 1. They're all together in one place. And we're again, we're all here together in one place. Now, not too long ago, 
what we're doing here this evening would not have been allowed to gather together without some form of whatever going on, right? But we're here, okay? Thanks be to God for that. We're in one place. And all of us, priests, religious, lay people, we all came through that period of time that was a time of profound longing and yearning in our life, especially for the Eucharist, especially for Mass, especially for times of adoration. And my prayer is that we never forget what that felt like. What did it feel like to go weeks, months, without being able to receive the Eucharist. A priest in my community, the Companions of the Cross, came back recently from Peru, where he went to visit up in the mountains. And he visited a village that had not had Mass celebrated in that parish church in 12 years. 12 years. Now, you say, well, that's because the Holy Spirit abandoned them? No. But there was that yearning and longing in their hearts. And I wonder, in our own hearts, if we want to become truly people who are alive in the power of the Holy Spirit in Pentecost, that we don't forget that. Because we, we long for community. We long to see each other. Right? We long to be with each other. We long to ask each other how we're doing. Right? We, long, we long to know that we're not alone. I know I'm not alone. So you look around, you see other people, like-minded people who want to surrender their lives, serve the Lord, support and encourage the, the, the ministry of the Companions of the Cross, etc. You know I'm praying for you, I'm praying for you. We're in this together. Right? Situations, circumstances in life, not easy, but we're in this uh, together. And so the question is, what am I willing to do? Like, what am I willing to do? How far am I willing to travel in order to encounter and receive Jesus in the Eucharist? Let me ask you this question. Do we, do we go to Parish X? Or do I belong to Parish X? Because if I just go to Parish X, I just go get what I want and get out. But if I belong, then it means I'm invested. It means I want to be part of the mission. It means I want to bring people to encounter the Lord through this place. It's not a question of just checking in, checking out. So do I go or do I belong? I want to belong a part of something and there's that yearning and longing in each of us is how we're hardwired or programmed because the church's mission has not changed circumstances and how the gospel is proclaimed and shared are changed three years ago this couldn't happen this gathering ten years ago we thought well this is crazy right why would you do that why would you want to have a you know kind of Catholic Christian thing in a coffee shop like that's kind of weird right no it's not it's proclaiming and bringing the message of the good news of Jesus Christ to others. Right? People are walking by outside right now on the street. People are actually coming in. And they're spending a moment thinking, there's a priest up there talking with a microphone. <laughs> God, there's some lights on those cameras. Like, this is weird. <laughs> it's not weird, right? You know? It's just about stepping up above the trench line, right? Getting out there dressed, you know, eschatologically, <laughs> reminding people of a, of a world to come, right? You know, because this isn't it, right? Am I a builder of community? Or am I a consumer of community? The Holy Spirit wants to inspire and infuse in all of us an appetite, a desire to be a builder of community. Again, I'm very happy that you're all here. I'm actually quite blessed and honored that you're all here. You respond to my invitation uh, to be here this evening. You know, and I'm thankful for your ongoing uh, support and encouragement and your prayers. And it goes both ways. Right? 
The desire to belong is integral to each of us. We all desire to belong. We all desire to be part of something bigger than ourselves and to know we're not alone. And the unfortunate thing is that we can, because we're weak, human, broken human beings, we can bend towards the creature rather than the creator to find our satisfaction in other things and people and places and whatnot. Now, we need things, right? I'm not against that. I mean, obviously, look at me. I have things, right? You know, I like good coffee, right? But am I a builder or am I a consumer? And Pentecost, it, it reminds us that we're no longer alone. Why do so many of our contemporaries feel inclined to go and chase after other things, other places, other people, whatever? Because deep down inside of us, there's a desire to know that we belong. And I want to belong. If somebody comes into our parish church we don't know personally, what do we do? I was four years chaplain at York University in Toronto. And we had a center, not as big as this, but you know, quite large enough with chairs and whatever, and the prime real estate was a leather couch. Oh yeah, this kind of ox blood leather couch, right? And I would remind the students, if somebody comes in that door that you don't know, and you're sitting on that couch, guess what? Bingo, time's up, up you go, right? <laughs> You're going to give that person <laughs> the prime real estate, right? <laughs> Ask their name, where they're from, et cetera. Engage in a conversation with them. Because you never know how much courage it takes them to climb four steps in the student union building and see a door. If I walk through that door and no one says anything to me, what do I do then? It's the same in our parishes, our prayer groups, whatever it is we belong to, right? I want to be, I want to be an ambassador. I want to be someone who welcomes the stranger, whoever that person is, right? Because we need and want to know that we belong. And Pentecost reminds us that we are no longer alone. The second part of this reflection is John 20, 22. Jesus breathed on them. Couldn't do that three years ago, right? <laughs> <laughs> Not that I'm advocating it now, <laughs> you know, just to breathe on each other. I'm going to stick to my notes here anyway. Uh, <laughs> so, Jesus breathed on them, right? Again, the doors were locked for fear of the authorities. They're in the upper room. They receive the Holy Spirit. He enters in. And he breathes on them. The Holy Spirit is not in quarantine the Holy Spirit's not locked down. The Holy Spirit's not in isolation. The Holy Spirit doesn't wear a mask. The Holy Spirit does not socially distance himself from us. Right? But the Holy Spirit, Jesus, they say to us, and this is where we make it personal. So all scripture is meant to be made personal. It's not just about that which happened. That well, was nice. Those guys got to experience something. No, it's what's still happening today. Jesus is, says to each of us, peace be with you. So again, any areas of worry, concern, fear, hesitation, doubt, whatever it is, peace be with you. And John Paul II, St. John Paul II now, he gave a talk to the bishops of Ontario about 20 years ago. And he talked about how in our modern cities there's this propensity to lock our doors. You walk into the house, you lock the door. You walk into the apartment, lock the door. Go to the grocery store, lock the car. Lock, lock, lock everything, right? This false sense of security on a spiritual level because Jesus, Jesus is a pretty good lock picker, right? <laughs> He's in there, kind of, he comes through the locked doors, right? Can kind of lock Jesus out. You know, he comes in not as a burglar to steal and, and take things from us, but as a burglar really to rob us of what's not of him, right? But he comes in nonetheless and he breathes on the disciples, peace be with you. And from that experience, the disciples go out. Again, because as Pope Francis reminds us, the Holy Spirit is an extrovert. And so when I experience the Holy Spirit, I become an extrovert. Not necessarily socially or personality-wise, 
to become the life of the party and bounce all over the place and whatever. But I go out. Our Blessed Mother, she has the power of the Holy Spirit at the Annunciation. And what does she do? Immediately, she goes with haste to visit her cousin Elizabeth. I'm kind of sauntering along, and I'll get there when I get there, with haste. Because right? she has some good news she wants to share with somebody else. So this haste is to be a characteristic of our spiritual life. And where did they go, the disciples? We're looking here at Acts chapter 2. Where did they go? After they had this profound experience of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, they went out to the streets of Jerusalem. And people heard them talking, all these different languages. How come I'm from Glengarry County? I understand exactly what he's saying, right? Because <laughs> they have the funny accent. Right? <laughs> Actually, I don't talk funny. You talk funny. Anyway, so <laughs> I talk normal. But anyway, so they go out to Jerusalem. So the question is, desiring one to be a, a person of Pentecost, where is my Jerusalem? Where is my Jerusalem? My street, neighborhood, grocery store, gym, coffee shop, parish church, where? Where, where is my Jerusalem? Because, again, a credible opportunity exists today for the church. And our Holy Father, Pope Francis, has been talking about it repeatedly, right? These, these new methods, new inspirations, new ways of, of bringing the gospel to the marketplace. Again, I'm up here talking, you're being very polite and watching me, but I can see what's going on behind me. People are walking down the street, they're coming in the door there, and they're standing there. Now, it's fine. Good to see you. God bless you. Come on in if you want, you know. But it's to bring the gospel to Jerusalem, wherever that Jerusalem is, where I find myself. Because people, people are starving to death for an experience of community. Starving to death for an encounter with the Lord. And but by the grace of God, where would you and I be? Like, let's be honest here. But by the grace of God, I wouldn't be standing up here with a fancy suit and the microphone. But, <laughs> but by the grace of God, right? Because if I think it's all about me, so how is the Lord at work in your life and in, in our life collectively? What do I have to share with others? How has the Lord made a difference in my life? And when I know that Jesus is my friend, everything changes. It's not a question of rules and regulations. It's a question of a relationship of, of love and peace and transformation and freedom ultimately. So yes, many of our contemporaries and ourselves too, we're tempted to look around people, places, things to find satisfaction. But yet from our experience, we can testify to how those leave us empty. So we pray God give us the grace we need to keep our eyes fixed on you. Jesus transformed this band of disciples and later the others, 120 in total, the power of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, he transformed them from being fearful individuals waiting behind locked doors into a band of effective evangelists. Just stepping out in faith. You think they had the blueprint? They had like the manual kind of thing? How many, you know, how many, you know, long-term, short-term, strategic, tactical meetings do you think they had to have? <laughs> Just do it, right? <laughs> Just proclaim the name of Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit. And if it fails, fine. At least it fails by falling flat in the floor of heaven. But this is not unique for me or for the religious sisters who are here. This all of us are called. Because you can get into places that I can't get into. You can go to places that I don't go to because of your vocation and your occupation and your family connections, etc. right? God, give me the grace to do your will. What would you have me do today? 
How would you have me serve today in this situation? What can I bring to this? Rather than what can I get out of this? Do I go or do I belong? I want to belong. But it will involve some change. Father Bob Bedard, again, the founder of the Companions of the Cross, he say, look around. Like, say, what is the Lord blessing? And get behind that. Not to evaluate, not to pass judgment. But there are certain things that are just kind of dying off. Let them die. Because the Lord is moving in a new way, as he did in other times, but now in this particular way. So it takes of us some, some faith, uh, humility, and it involves a personal decision. A personal decision to let the Lord in. Hence, Pentecost, unlock the door. At this sound, this is the third scripture reference, Acts chapter 2, at this sound, the crowd gathered. Right? And again, we've, we've gathered. They've gathered in response to a particular invitation. Right? Others are gathering, you know, as a result of the sound. Lights are on. People are in there. Doors open. Let's go in, you know. And here we are. At the sound, the crowd gathered. We're a crowd. We're gathered. Like what kind of sound are we making? Right? Are we attracting others? 12-step program of Alcoholics Anonymous talks about attraction rather than promotion. Posters are good. Facebook posts are nice. But people are better. We talk about that, right? Like, uh, how'd you find that particular mechanic? Or how'd you find your accountant or massage therapist or whatever? Word of mouth. Someone told me about this great guy, you know, he can look after you. So let's go see the guy, right? Now we got a guy. Right? <laughs> Do things, you know. <laughs> but that's how the gospel is, is promoted and encouraged is by word of mouth and attraction rather than promotion. So am I attractive? I don't mean in a physical way, but am I attractive in a spiritual way? Because again, many of our contemporaries and but by the grace of God, ourselves living in places of isolation and fear, and darkness, anxiety. There's a prominent theme of individualism and entitlement in our culture today. But they came out, and we can come out of these places and encounter God in community. If and when they hear, we hear, they see, we see in us the genuine reason for our hope. The world needs hope. And the hope has a name. And his name is Jesus. I want to encounter more of Jesus and know more of Jesus. That changes my heart. And the things that I thought were all that important and necessary and no, not. Okay. I'll just surrender that over to the Lord. Because the Lord is very much in charge, still very much in charge. I want to share with you an excerpt from a book by Michael O'Brien, who is a well-known Canadian author and artist, called A Father's Tale. Perhaps some of you have read it. It's about the story of Alexander Graham, who's a father, who goes out in search of his prodigal son. So it's, it's based on the story of the prodigal son. The father in Luke's gospel account stays home. But in the father's tale, Michael O'Brien has the father going out in search of his son, his prodigal son. And through many twists and turns and fates and divine providence, Alexander finds himself teaching English at a school in Siberia where communism has, has crushed the spirit of the people. And he shows his students one day how to build an igloo, into which one night he puts a series of lanterns that lights up the igloo from the inside out. And this is the effect that that had on this village. 
if you want to look up the scripture ref the uh, sorry the story reference is page 756 until 784 but I'll just give you a synopsis so this is the effect that that action had on that particular village crushed by the spirit of communism silence fell on the crowd as they gazed upon the illuminated igloo Soon doors opened in the nearby houses and more people came out to see what was happening. Soon the igloo was ringed by admirers. As each new person approached, they fell silent. Within 15 minutes, it seemed as if the entire village had arrived. Some were joining hands, young and old, Bodies began to sway forward and backward in a gentle current. People turned to each other and chatted quietly in a neighborly fashion. So what, what was the attraction of this igloo on this cold Siberian night lit internally by lights, lanterns? What was the attraction for the people in Jerusalem? on the day of the first Pentecost. What are we looking for? What are the people walking down the street and coming in the door looking for? One of the characters in the book summarizes it quite well. She said, it tells the villagers that a house of light is possible. And more than that, it shows them that other houses of light are possible perhaps greater houses of light. And they lay down to sleep, they gaze into the darkness, and the darkness is no longer burdensome. For the house glows in their minds. It shows them that they love the light. And in time, they will come to hunger for the house of light, capital L, that can never be destroyed. It's a modern day version of Pentecost, isn't it? They all came together, they gathered in one place, the light, Jesus Christ, who himself says, I am the light of the world, drew them. He draws us together. But we're not meant to stay here. Coffee will run out. <laughs> Treats will all be gone, right? We're not gonna all stay here. We're gonna go out from here inspired and encouraged by the fact that we know we're no longer alone, that I belong, I have a part to play, I have something to contribute, I have encountered he who is the light of the world, and I want to share that with others. Yes, by my words, but more importantly, by my actions. Because again, when I know that Jesus is my friend, everything changes. And people can see the difference in us and hear the difference in us. So, again, the first Pentecost was experienced by fearful disciples living behind locked doors at a difficult time who were transformed when Jesus came in. Sound familiar? It's today. Because, again, we can experience fear. We can live behind locked doors. We're definitely in a difficult time. When was the church never in a difficult time? You know, I tell people, you know, the world's been nuts about five minutes after Adam and Eve ate the apple, right? This is crazy, right? <laughs> but thanks be to God, God has come, right? And Pentecost, it continues to, to invite us to make a decision, to unlock the door of our heart, of our life and willingness is the key to unlocking the door and so my prayer my hope for you and for me us together is that the attractive sound next apostle says the people in jerusalem were attracted like i'm hearing people speak in my own language what the heck's going on around here you know they had found that attractive but the attractive sound that others hear be the sound of 
door bolts opening. The sound of door bolts of our heart, door bolts of our life opening. Click, click, click. And coupled with the voice of Jesus. Peace be with you. It's not condemning. It's not criticizing. It's an inviting voice. Peace be with you. I am that peace. Will you let me in? Unbolt the doors of our life. The Easter season began on the Easter vigil with a fire. Easter season ends on Pentecost with a fire. And those of us who were at the Easter vigil from the new fire that was blessed, we each lit our taper that themselves symbolized the tongue of fire that was resting upon the, the head of the 120 gathered together in the upper room. So the season ends in the same way it, it finishes. And fires, fires can unite us. They can unite us in a tragedy when we come together to help put a fire out or help a family that has been left homeless because of a fire. But fires also bring us together in peace and harmony when we gather together with our families, you know, our friends around a campfire at the cottage or the beach, etc. So fire brings us together, and the Holy Spirit has again brought us together. I had an inspiration. I shared that with James. He said, let's go for it. Okay. Or two or more agree on anything, it's going to happen, right? <laughs> so we did it, right? Step out in faith. No idea how it's going to, re how it's going to happen or how what's going to... Again, if we're going to wait until everything is perfect and all the conditions are ready, nothing's going to happen. Right? Father Bob Bedard said something similar to that. He said, ever since discernment became fashionable, no one's made a decision. Right? <laughs> I'm just going to discern here. Well, get, just do it. Right? See how it happens, how it works. Right? But again, the Holy Spirit has brought us together as a community in a time of difficulty for the church to be explosively alive, and it requires of each of us, maybe for the first time or for the tenth time since we got up this morning, to invite Jesus into our life. Here's a good line. You might want to write this down. It, this is, this is, this, this is, James, this could go viral, actually, you know, but this. <laughs> Unlocking the door of our heart lights the fuse for the change. Uh -huh. <laughs> Unlocking the door of our heart lights the fuse for the change. This explosively alive church. Wind also brings about a change. And here in Ottawa, the last couple of days, we've experienced a lot of wind. Right? Where is this wind all coming from? Right? Come from somewhere. But it means that a change is coming. Tomorrow is supposed to be, what, 27 degrees here. It's like, too hot, right? <laughs> so the wind is blowing this air out in anticipation of another huge mass of air coming in. So wind brings about change. Again, Acts chapter 2, this rush of a violent wind filled the entire house. Not just the first floor and then the upstairs bathroom. The entire house. Does Jesus have permission to enter into every room in the house of my life? Cardinal Reniero Cantalamesa, the papal preacher, tells a story of being invited to a family's home to bless the home. In anticipation of arriving at their house, they cleaned the house by opening the door to the basement and just <laughs> throwing everything down the stairs. <laughs> Newspapers, laundry, dogs, blanket, whatever, out down the stairs, you know, boom, their house is clean, right? <laughs> so Cardinal Contra Mesa arrives to bless the house, starts on the main floor, goes upstairs and says, now I'd like to go on and bless your furnace, right? Gigs up, right? <laughs> Gigs up, right? Does Jesus have access to every room in the house of my life 
or is there one room and I say, you know what? No, 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 no. That's my little room. It's my little thing. My little stuff. You know, all that in there. Go away. You know? Buzz off. That's the place where I isolate. You know the difference between isolation and solitude? Solitude is being alone with God. Isolation is being alone with yourself. Close the door. Message is clear. Get lost. Does Jesus have access to every room in the house of my life? This wind filled every room, the entire house. How has the Holy Spirit been changing me for the better? God didn't cause COVID-19, but he allowed it to happen. And I think a lot of good actually did come out of it. How has the Lord inspired in me new interests, friendships, hobbies, spiritual growth, right? Opportunities to evangelize, opportunities to proclaim the gospel, opportunities to reach people that we would never be able to reach before by stepping out and opening the window. Right? Tomorrow's going to be a warm day here in Ottawa, and I said to the brothers at the house this evening, I said, tomorrow afternoon we're going to open all the windows in the house for about an hour. Get rid of all this old winter dead air <laughs> out of the house, right? We do that at home, growing up in the farm this time of the year. Open all the windows in the house, just blow all the stuff that's been lingering around <laughs> for a winter <laughs> and get the fresh air in here, right? Letting in the fresh air of the Holy Spirit. But it is our, it's our experience, our strength, and our hope Joy, peace, suffering, pain that makes up life. It's what the Holy Spirit empowers so that we can testify, we can share to others in a language that they can identify with. This is not somebody who just read a book. This is somebody who's actually lived a life. And there's something about her, something about him that I want. I can identify with. What is that? Right. That, that's, that sparks the, the initial conversation. In other words, we, we minister from weakness. We don't minister from strength. Because how did the disciples recognize Jesus in his post-resurrection appearances? By his wounds. And even in the glorified pictures and depictions of Jesus, resurrected from the dead, you still see his wounds. Am I afraid to show Jesus my wounds? Am I afraid to show others that I'm wounded? Henry Nouwen's book, right? The Wounded Healer. Am I willing to be 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 willing? <laughs> when I arrive at that place, okay, Lord, here, okay, I've arrived at this place of willingness. Let's just start there. Letting the Holy Spirit have his way with me. And as Father Bob Bedard said, thanking Jesus for what he wants to do even before I know what it is. Ooh, okay. Even before I know what it is. Thanking him for that. And appreciating he has a purpose, he has a plan. The Lord is in charge, the Lord's at work. So I'm going to take a moment now. We're just going to pray uh, together. Asking the Lord to send forth his blessing upon each of us. So Lord Jesus, we do thank you for the gift of this day. We thank you, Jesus, for the gift of each person here tonight, Lord. You have brought us together as a community, a family of faith, Lord. We thank you, Jesus, that because of what you have done for us, Lord, we can know that we are no longer alone. It is here, Jesus, that we can be satisfied in that desire that you have placed in each of our hearts to belong to something greater than ourselves. 
Lord Jesus, you know what each of us is going through in our life. We pray especially, Lord, for anyone here this evening who is carrying a very heavy burden in their life, that you would minister to their heart, Lord Jesus. Remind them, Lord, that you are always with them. We pray for anyone here, Lord, who has been away from you in the sacrament of confession for a long time, anyone, Lord, living under layers of fear or shame, that you would just wipe that away, Lord, speak gently to their heart, call them back to yourself, Jesus. We pray, Lord Jesus, for the grace this evening to choose to unlock the door of our heart, unlock the door of our life, and to let you in. We say, come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle in each of us, Jesus, the fire of your love. We thank you, Jesus, that Pentecost is not something that just happened, it's still something happening. Breathe on us, Holy Spirit, your fresh and fragrant breeze of faith, hope, and love. May we, Holy Spirit, breathe in the clean, life-giving air of your presence. May we breathe out to others the joy, the peace of knowing you and living our lives in union with you, Jesus, and your church. Pour out, Jesus, on each of us here, we pray, the gifts of your Holy Spirit. Activate them, Lord. Activate them in our life for the common good and the building up of your church. Amen. And may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit come down upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. I think you know how this ends. When we're powerless, that's when we're strong and victory is indeed gained through surrender and in the meantime stay caffeinated okay god bless you <laughs> that's great god bless you my dear friends thanks for journeying along with me i hope you enjoyed this presentation i very much thoroughly enjoyed giving it especially in front of a live studio audience in one of my natural habitats coffee shops here in the city of ottawa don't forget to subscribe to my channel if you are new stay tuned to the companions of the cross website for more information about other live presentations i will be doing in other coffee shops here in Ottawa and perhaps beyond. God bless your day.